All right, so uh, thanks for uh, coming this morning or this afternoon or wherever you're at. Um, so we're going to talk about a new R package called Recipes, <clears throat> and it's mostly uh, uh, its purpose is mostly about creating uh, uh, design matrices and data sets and pre-processing pre-processing them with uh, various techniques that we'll go into more. So uh, just to maybe get started, talk about a simple like linear model that we might use. Um, and there's a data set in Carrot. So if you were load Carrot and load the data set Sacramento, uh, what you'd find is a data set where there are um, um, data for uh, houses that were sold in Sacramento within like a five-day period. So there are things like the sale price of the house, the square footage, number of beds and baths. There's like longitude and latitude and that kind of thing. Um, there's also the type of house, which oddly only has three levels. Um, but that's all in that data set. And let's assume that you wanted to you know, build a model to predict the price of a house. So you might think about using LM to do that and to create uh, this model, you use the LM function. And LM takes a formula. And so we'll be talking about formulas a little bit. And you know, uh, just as a demonstration for this is not probably how I would model these data, but uh, you might take the log of the price because it's a very skewed variable. And that's your outcome since it's on the left-hand side of the tilde there. And then on the right-hand side, we have basically a symbolic representation of what our model is going to be. And basically this says, you know, we're going to model the log of price as a function of the type of house and its square footage. Um, and that data is in this data frame called Sacramento. And then with LM and formula methods, uh, you, can, um, you can add a little bit here that's a subset command. So this would filter the Sacramento data to look only for where there are three or more um, uh, bedrooms, if that's the data you want to analyze. And so basically, the purpose of the code chunk, if you take it step by step, is uh, you know the first thing we would do would be to subset the data set that you're going to model using that command. Um, and then it creates a, a, what's called a design matrix, which is, if you think about linear regression, we usually think of like, you know, y is equal to x beta plus epsilon. And the x part of that is the predictors, and that's our, what the old school people like me would call a design matrix. Um, so the second thing that that function does is to create a design matrix. Now there's two predictors, there's type and square footage, but you end up getting uh, three model terms. Uh, the type variable is a factor, and that factor has three levels. So when it creates dummy variables for that, it will actually make uh, two columns of that three level factor that are zero and one for the different types of houses. And then you have the third term for square footage. So your, your design matrix, even though you have two predictors, actually has um, the non-intercept uh, parts of that design matrix are there's three columns. And then the, the third thing it does would be to log transform the outcome variable, which is price. And then it actually gets around to actually fitting the linear regression model using uh, lm.fit and some other stuff that we don't normally mess with. Um, but anyway, the, the first two steps of that is really the part that it creates a design matrix. And again, we usually, I'm not gonna be formulas really in here, but we represent that as X. So, you know, I, I wrote uh, for our studio uh, a, a couple of blog posts on the formula method. And so just summarizing, and you can I have a link to those in the slides and you can find those. But basically, you know, the, the great thing about the model form, it's very expressive. So, you know, you can, you can say what your predictor is, what your outcome is. You can have these inline functions like, you know, logging price will ensure that, you know, that happens in the, uh, you don't have to pre-log your data. Uh, you can have interaction terms and nesting and all sorts of great things. So they're very expressive. And if you're doing something that's pretty simple, like, you know, the housing model I was showing, um, it's extremely uh, efficient and, uh, and nice to use. Um, under the hood, and this is what the blog post goes into, it, it actually does some pretty elegant functional programming, which, you know, surprises me that that's been, a, I've been looking at it for years, but that's been around for quite a long time in, you know, the original S language. So you don't really think of R as a functional programming language, but you know a core part of that, the, the model.matrix and LM and all that is, is pretty nicely done functionally. Um, and again, I, I kind of already mentioned this, uh, you can embed functions uh, in the formula like I did with price here. Um, and the cool thing about that is, you know, if we were to log, let's say, square footage, um, not only can we do that in line, and it would log that variable for the data that you have that you're fitting the model on, when you go to use the predict function, on a new data set. Again, you don't have to pre-log square footage. You would just give it, you know, the column of square footage. And since it knows it's recorded that transformation in the formula, it can actually apply to that to whatever you're interested in. 
Uh, but there are some limitations um, to what uh, the function sort of, or the, the formula framework can do. Um, and as I'll talk about in the next few slides, there's some inefficiencies that can occur there. Um, and it's mostly, I think, because it's, it's a really amazingly well-designed system, but it was designed where I think nobody envisioned having maybe hundreds of variables in their model um, and, you know, the sort of large-scale modeling that, that people um, can do today. And so I think it sort of suffers a little bit in those instances. So just some examples of that is let's say you want to do something a little more complicated with your features. Let's say you have some missing data that you need to impute, and, uh, and then you're putting uh, that data into a model like a support vector machine or partial least squares or something where you need to center and scale those values. Um, and so you can envision maybe doing something with formula where you have an outcome and utility and then since you have these inline functions, you might think of, well, I want to impute my variable first based on k-nearest neighbors, and then, you know, since I need to center and scale, I can center them and, and take the output of that and scale it. And that seems fine, but that, that's problematic on a lot of levels in terms of how the formula infrastructure works. And one of those being that if you need to impute a bunch of variables, uh, let's say with k-nearest neighbors, you would need to store the original data set. And since the, the functional programming bit of LM deals with each variable separately, you'd end up storing the, the same data set many, many times for every variable you want to impute. So not only is it problematic just from a, a programming standpoint, just even if this code would work, it's kind of a bad idea because you end up having many, many variations or the same data set included many times. So, you know, uh, this is not a, a terribly obscure thing to do, uh, but it does limit you to what you can do in the, the formula method. Uh, another thing is, um, there are a lot of modeling functions such as LM and R parts a good example where you don't have a non-formula interface to the model. So you're, you're constrained to always specify your model using a formula. And the problem with that is you can't really recycle things. So if you've already done the, all the work to generate the design matrix for LM, there's no way to take that and recycle it into R part. Um, so that's, you know, that's problematic in a way. Um, another thing that I won't get into too much, but you can find it uh, in the blog post that's linked down here. Um, is that the way the formula method information is stored is pretty inefficient. And it's especially inefficient when you have a large number of variables. So we show in that blog post, um, based on like, you know, like using R part or random forest, that if you have a lot of predictors, like in the thousands, um, you can spend maybe half the time of that modeling function just creating the design matrix. So it does have some weaknesses for particularly wide data sets. It's not really weak in the sense of, if I have millions of data points like rows, but when you think about columns, um, the way it stores the information about the formula is, is not efficient and it, I don't want to say it necessarily exponentially increases in inefficiency as the number of predictors goes up, but it, it's not good. Um, so that's not great. Uh, another thing that isn't necessarily a, a limitation, but it's always sort of confounded me is, if you're gonna do anything multivariately, you wanna specify more than one thing on the left-hand side of the formula, and you would need to wrap those in C-bind, which is just kind of ugly. Um, so, you know, that's something that we don't like. And then um, another more fundamental aspect of formulas is there's really a limited set of roles that variables in your data set can take. And again, as we do things that are more complicated beyond linear regression, that becomes a, a big sort of more philosophical limiting factor of what this formula technology can do. <clears throat> so as an example of that, now, let's say you're fitting like a hierarchical model, whether it's using STAN or, um, or LME or, or whatnot. Um, you know, you have variables in your data set that are going to be included in the, as outcomes and predictors, but then you have data that define the hierarchy. So if you take this example from the uh, LME4 documentation, you know, you have a, a subject effect. So you're modeling in the sleep study, you're modeling uh, this outcome called a reaction as a function of days. And I think this model is a, a random coefficient model that would give you um, a hierarchical model based on uh, with random effects probably for the intercept in days. And those intercept, uh, those those random effects are connected to the subject specification. And so subject is not a predictor, but it's something you need to carry along with a role as your your you know your ID variable for the for the um, for the methodology. And so you know that's the reason that this formula looks different than the others is because that particular package in a way had to sort of rewrite the formula method to make that work um, because that's what they needed. Uh, another example is something called the Bradley-Terry 2 package. 
And that's kind of a, an interesting package that can model competitions between, um, between variables. So, you know, like if you had a, a boxing, data on boxing, you might be modeling um, whether one person can win over another and you might have a dozen people. And so the thing is, uh, you might want to model that as a function of, let's say, reach. And so in the Bradley Terry model, it's basically like a, a souped up logistic regression. And, um, but in order to have that formula method work in this, this instance, they sort of had to invent a new way of doing formulas, uh, simply because the current methodology doesn't let you really specify things. And then another example is there's a, a, a boosting method called uh, uh, MOB. And you can imagine it's sort of like a recursive partitioning model, like our part, but it fits uh, linear models in, in the terminal nodes. And so when you fit this model, you want to specify which variables are used for splitting to make the tree, and then which variables are used in the model in the terminal nodes. And so they wrote, wrote a whole new package called model tools that will allow you to have, you know, sort of multiple formulas. And so again, with the bar here, this is a, another situation where people needed different roles of these predictors. You have predictors that you want to use for splitting and predictors that you want to use for modeling. And that sort of is not really going to happen in the current um, standard formula method. So, you know, if you think about maybe other roles, the ones I could think of is you have the traditional predictors and outcomes. Um, sometimes you have stratification variables, like if you're doing a clinical trial and you have, uh, you want to stratify over sites, that's a, a separate variable. Again, that's not, you're not necessarily doing direct computations on it, but you need it. Um, you know, a lot of models, when we want to capture the performance of the model, sometimes that involves other data. So if we're predicting whether somebody's going to repay a loan or not, we don't necessarily care about the accuracy of that model. We care about the expected loss that comes from that. And if you're going to compute the expected you know, profit, um, you're going to need something like the loan amount. So again, it's another variable that you need to carry along, but it's not really a predictor or an outcome. So you, you, know, you can't really do much with the standard formula for that. And there's a variety of other things like you know, fastening or uh, random effects, like I mentioned. Now, case weights and offsets are kind of special cases and, and sometimes error terms, because there have been some exceptions written to the formula method where you could have like an offset variable and declare that in the formula method. They're, those are kind of hard-coded things that are in the base package. And, they're not easily extensible to have one for stratification. Well, there is a strata function in uh, the survival package, but uh, you can see my point is if you had an arbitrary role that you're creating, you can't really do that with the current set of formulas. So to me, philosophically, this is the, the, the larger problem. You know, all the, all the programming aspects of formulas that we don't, you know, like so much, like the inefficiency sometimes can be programmed out, but this is something I think is really baked into the system. So we came up with this idea of something called a recipe, and uh, there's a big food analogy that's going to happen here. And so basically the idea of a recipe is you can think of a recipe really as a sequence of steps, right? So you're going to make a lasagna, it tells you what the ingredients are, and it says, you know, assemble it like this and then bake the thing. Um, but if you think about the, the linear model we had earlier, you know, a sequence of steps might be saying, hey, you know, price is our outcome. That's maybe step one to declare that. And then we might declare the predictors to be type and square foot. And then another thing we did there in LM was to say, well, we should log transform price. And then the fourth thing we did, we could say in that, that sequence of steps is, you know, let's convert that type variable into dummy variables. And that kind of defines uh, the, the procedure that the LM formula method, you know, the formula method with LM actually did when we first showed that code. And so the thing is a recipe, at least as I've stated here, is a for, it's really what we're intending to do. It's not actually doing it necessarily. So one of the issues with you know, model.matrix and all that is the specification of what you want to do is coupled directly with doing it. So that's one of the reasons you can't really recycle things very easily between um, methodologies. So you know, what recipes does is basically says, well, let's specify what we want to do. And they, we won't actually, we'll delay the execution of that doing until we you know, say, well, these are the data we want to do it with. Uh, so we kind of separate the, the planning of what we want to do from actually making it happen. Uh, I'll show you, uh, there's uh, a link uh, in the slides, but if you want to install it, it's not in Crane yet, but there's a, a GitHub page for it here. Um, and it's got you know, a lot of examples. And as you can imagine, if you see my other packages, there's a boatload of documentation. Um, right now, if you want to, to use it, you basically uh, load the, or install or load the DevTools package, and then use install into our GitHub with uh, my GitHub ID and recipes. And that's currently the way you get it, but it, it really should be on CRAN pretty soon. Um, so this will be linked in the, uh, the slides. 
So once you load that, um, just for convenience, I also load a dplyr so we can get the pipe operator and some other things. And so if you wanted to reproduce maybe what Elm was doing before, we start off, um, I'll show you a different way to create the initial recipe, but if we only have prediction outcomes, if we don't have any special roles that we want to apply to our data, um, we can start with basically a symbolic representation of what should be in the model by saying price is a, you know, a function of a type and square footage. Now the data that you use here doesn't have to be the original data. It's just what we do in this particular step is we want to record what data are in that data frame and what their, their attributes are. Like are they factors, are they numbers, uh, and so on. So this doesn't have to be a large data set if you have a very large data set. And once you have the recipe, basically, you don't have to use pipes, but I'll do that for convenience here, is you can start adding steps to the recipe. So if we want to take the original recipe and add a step that says, hey, log transform this variable, um, we could do this little bit. And that basically modifies the recipe to include a, a step of that recipe saying, you know, log that variable called price. And then another thing we can do is to say to add on to that is to convert type to dummy variables. And so at that point, what we've done is we've come up with a specification of what the roles are using this formula method like we used before. Um, and then we've talked about or described what kind of pre-processing or actions we want to happen for those variables by just adding these steps to them. Um, and so it's, it's fairly reminiscent if you've ever used carrot to the, the sort of, in some ways, like the pre-process uh, part of carrot where you can decide what kind of pre-processing you want with your variables. But again, all this does at this point is it says, well, what is the specification what I want to do? And all we've said at this point was price is the outcome, type and square footage are predictors, we're going to log price and create dummy variables for type. It doesn't actually do anything but record those actions. And then uh, in this whole food analogy, we want to take this recipe and prepare it. Then what prepare does is basically you can think of it as training or learning or fitting the pre-processing steps. So for example, we have dummy variables here for type. So when we do this, we're just saying we want to make dummy variables. When we run prepare, what it actually does is it interrogates the data that we've given it and says, okay, what are the levels of type and how exactly am I going to make those dummy variables? So once you start prepare, that's when you're actually doing computations and storing information about the specifics of those actions. Um, now, one little thing that I've done here, you wouldn't necessarily have to do is, I'm saying retain equal true, and what that says is take the data set that I've given it, and when you estimate um, these actions that you're going to do for the recipe, keep the modified version of that training set around. Keep it in this object. And that'll um, stop us from having to redo computations over and over again. So that's a nice little feature. And you'll see that. I'll mention that in a few minutes um, when I'm showing how things are sort of cached when we do this. So again, we've specified what the actions are. We've sort of estimated the things that we need to estimate. And then when you do that, it tells you which steps. There's a verbose option, but right now it tells you what steps are being executed as they're executed. And then when we actually want to get the design matrix to put in LM, you know, the analogy here is we're going to bake that recipe. So we take the, the object that we created that has all the information we need from the data. And then the new data option here says, well, you know, apply this, uh, this recipe to this data set. So if you're like in the machine learning or the predictive modeling world, you might have a training and test set. And so you can apply these operations that you estimate from your training set to the test set or to any new samples that you get. Um, it's kind of like a predict or an apply method where you're basically um, projecting all the, the pre-processing methods on whatever data set you're interested in. And that will give you your design matrix. So, um, so that's the basic idea behind recipes is you specify what you want you estimate the things that you need to estimate, and then you apply it at will to whatever data sets that you want, which could be the original data set like it was here. Um, and that's the basic idea. So the, the rest of it is sort of talking about the features and some of the things that you can do. Now, one of the things you may have noticed here is, you know, when I create this step for price, you know, I'm not quoting any variables here. And if you're a person who's used dplyr, um, you can see some similarity here where there's a bunch of um, dplyr-like things happening here. Like we can pipe in information and sort of update objects, and you can see I'm not having to quote variables when I do this. <clears throat> but the interesting thing about recipes is, unlike dplyr, uh, we might want to specify what variables are used in different steps based on more than their name. So right now, and as I'll show you in a minute, you can specify any number of variables in these steps by using their name 
or the standard dplyr things like you know matches or starts with so you can use these sort of like functions to declare what variables are used in the steps but sometimes we might want to do let's say dummy variables and do it on all the all the variables that i have in the data set that are not numeric that let's say are, are factor variables and so we also have these selectors that you can use that are things like all numeric so if we want to have a step um, we can say, well, do that for all the numeric predictors that are in my data set, or do it on all the predictors or all the outcomes, and you can add and subtract these like you would with dplyr. So, for example, if you want to do a PCA, you can't really do that on factor variables. So you might want to specify, um, do it on all the predictors that are numeric, and then you could do that like sort of like you have here, with a sequence of selectors. I mean, you can always just type the names in with common delimited um, unquoted variable names, but if you want to be a little more um, uh, concise about what you're doing, um, you can do that. Now, one interesting aspect of a recipe is you might be doing, or you might be saying, let's do some operations on variables that don't necessarily like exist yet. So, you know, for example, if you're going to discretize predictors or, as you'll see in a little bit, do like PCA feature extraction, um, you might do PCA and say, give me the number of PCA variables that capture 95% of the variability. And that might be four of them, or it might be 100 of them, depending on the data set and the correlation structure and all that. So what's interesting about recipes is you might be making, uh, you might be wanting to do operations in the variables that actually don't not even exist yet, but you don't have to know how many of them there are. So, you know, you can do things like, you know, matches, uh, you know, PC one through nine, which would capture, you know, the first whatever principal components you have there. And then make sure that you also capture the numeric predictors, but maybe your outcome is numeric, so you might want to get rid of that one. So you have a really, really rich set of way to specify variables in these recipes. Um, and then we have a whole part of the vignette, uh, or the website has a whole vignette on selecting variables and examples of different ways of doing that. So there's quite a lot there that you can do. All right, so one cool thing about the recipes is you can start with a recipe like the one we have. The current recipe we have, it all, the only thing it does is really it logs the outcome and creates dummy variables. But again, let's say you want to center and scale your data and then maybe apply, it wouldn't really make sense for this particular example, but let's say you wanted to apply PCA signal extraction. Well, once you have your, your recipe, whether it's been trained or not, um, you can just keep adding steps to it and make that a different, uh, a different recipe. So you can sort of save, in a way you can sort of like cache where you've gotten so far save it as another name and add other steps to it. And I'll show you an example of this towards the end with some um, dimension reduction routines. So if we start off with this recipe that you know, we've already done some computations on, and we add some more steps, when we go to prepare this recipe, it doesn't need to redo um, the ones that have already been executed. So you can, you know, when we go to prepare the recipe with our training set, you know, step center is going to need it to calculate all the means of the numeric predictors and step scale will calculate the standard deviations of all the numeric predictors and then when it calculates the loadings and things like that for pca that's the things that prepare will do it won't redo necessarily the things oops the things that you've already done uh, in the recipe so when i go to run uh, prepare um, on this new recipe now i didn't say new data equal or i'm sorry training data equal to sacramento and the reason I didn't have to do that is this retain equal true. If I don't, if I don't retain the, the original predictors, uh, the original data set, then I would need to add that here. But the, the value of, of having that sort of uh, retained is when you go to do this new set of processing, you can see when it gives you the log of what it's doing, it puts pre-trained here because it's telling you I don't need to redo those computations because nothing's changed. Um, and then it does all the estimation it needs to do for the remaining steps. So the cool thing about this is, let's say you want to try a bunch of different things. Uh, you want to create a, a bunch of different, let's say, design matrices to see what works for your model or your data. And let's say, again, you have some expensive imputation step that you need to do before you start doing these things because you have missing data. Well, you can do that imputation step, which might be sort of computationally taxing, but you don't have to redo it every time you create a different design matrix. You can just sort of recycle those computations. And so that saves you a lot of time, potentially, um, when you're creating these things. Or if you're doing something complicated, like you like an autoencoder or some, some really like complex and big part of these recipes, you can, you can basically cache the results up to that point, which is kind of a nice feature. 
so you know, this is kind of like the shock and us uh, slide. You know, uh, here are the things that I've I've gotten into recipes so far. Um, you have a lot of basic things like roots and roots and logs and polynomials and, and all that stuff. Um, and again, anything I'm sort of missing here, whether it's obscure or not, uh, please let me know. Um, there are a bunch of things we can do with encodings now. So we can do, of course, dummy variables, which is you know sort of a standard thing. You know, one thing you could do, like in the Sacramento data set, is there's a predictor for city. So you might want to include the actual city as a as a you know a different um, dummy variable in the model. But the problem is, you know, even though we have a thousand or so uh, data points, some of these cities only have two or three instances in the data. So what you'd like to be able to do is to you know dynamically say, well, you know, give me dummy variables, but it, you know if the frequency of any uh, group in that in that factor is very small, let's say like one percent or five percent or whatever your tolerance is. Can you change the factor levels and dump those into an other level? Um, you can do that with four cats and in Vtreat, I think you can do that in those packages. Uh, but you know, you can have a step that would actually sort of reassemble the factor levels based on that. Um, I'm not a big fan of binning, but you know, we have discretization steps. Um, one other cool thing I had for an example or a data set I've been working on is let's say you have a predictor that is a date field, you know, it's a date uh, class in R. You know, you're probably not going to analyze it as a date. You want to analyze whether, you know, the month has an effect or the day of the week has an effect. And so we have a step that basically can uh, do all the encodings for dates. If you want to take that single column of your data and make a bunch of features out of that for different ways to represent dates, well, you can do that. Um, it'll also give you indicators if you want for holidays. So, you know, if you're modeling something that is dependent on whether that date is a holiday or not, you might want to have predictors in your model for that. And so we have a, a nice holiday holiday step. Um, similar to Carrot, we have a bunch of filters for you know highly correlated predictors and things like that. Um, imputation right now, key nearest neighbors, bag trees, simple mean mode imputation. Um, you know, there's a lot more you can put in there. Uh, simple normalization, transformation type things. Um, again, these are very similar to what's in Carrot. And again, if there's anything missing here, um, uh, please let me know. Um, there's a great package called uh, Dimred, D-I-M-R-E-D, and I kind of capitalized on that where it has a nice interface to a bunch of dimension re reduction uh, operations. And so, you know, right now it's really easy for you to do a step that's PCA or kernel PCA. So you, you might have a bunch of variables, and this is an example I'll show in a minute. You might have a ton of variables that you just want to do some plotting with, and you might need to log some things and maybe do some transformations. And so what I'll show you in a minute is you can try a bunch of different dimension reduction techniques without redoing a bunch of computations prior to that. So there's there's a lot of steps here that will allow you to do these things. And then there's things like you know basic expansions and interactions, which of course we need. Uh, and there's a lot more to put in. You know I've got a little list in GitHub. You know trying to find a good autoencoder um, package. There's more imputation methods that we can be done here, like or. Um, uh, singular value decomposition. So there's a lot there. Um, there's a lot of documentation for all these. But again, you know, let me know if there's something really lacking here. So um, you know, I, I've already mentioned. You might have said, well, Max, you know, the recipe you had before started off with a formula. I thought we were trying to get away from formula method, um, and that'd be right. The the value of using the formula in the initial recipe is um, if you only have an outcome in or outcomes in predictors. Um, you know, that's the most syntactically concise way of doing it because the, the situation is not that complicated in terms of roles. But let's say you do have something more complicated. Another way of assembling the recipe is not using the formula. So you can say, you know, I want to have a recipe and the data, the original data set is, you know, here. Um, and then what you can do is you can take all the variables that, that are in that data set and they'll be available and then you can start defining their roles. So you can add a role for price being the outcome. And these are not hard coded. There's not like a pre-specified list that you have to choose from. So if you want to come up with some new uh, type of role for whatever modeling method you're doing, this is basically like free text. You can put in whatever you want. Now we do use outcome and predictor a lot in the package. So if that's the traditional roles these things are playing, stick to outcome and stick to predictor. But let's say you want to have the zip code as a stratification variable. So you might want to fit this linear model separately for every zip code. Um, and so you can have that column in your data set come along for the ride, not be created into dummy variables. And then when you extract that using the bake function, um, you know what its role is and you know what you can get. So um, 
So as an example, if you wanted to have a, a little wrapper around uh, linear regression, you know, the underlying function that does the linear model fit is called lm.fit, and it takes an x variable, which is your design matrix, and it takes a y variable that is your vector. Uh, I think it has to be a vector of uh, numbers. You could, you know, have it, that function be parameterized in terms of have a recipe and some data, and then inside that function, you could actually do the prepare bit uh, because the recipe already has the steps all pre-specified, so you don't need to specify them here. Um, and then when you fit LM, you can just get the design matrix by doing bake and then add dplyr selectors for what variables you want to be returned um, from that call. So if I just want the predictors, my design matrix would basically be this. And then if I only want the outcome, I can do the same thing, you know, use this bake command, but only get the outcome back. And so, you know, again, if you had stratification variables, you could say, you know, uh, role is, you know, strat or, or whatever you want to select these things by roles. Um, one other nice thing about this is um, since the steps are all sort of independent of each other, you know, this isn't baked in quite yet. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't use another food analogy, but this isn't really uh, written yet. But the cool thing is, is if we have some pre-processing method that's available, let's say, in scikit-learn, and we have uh, scikit-learn installed on a computer, you know, it wouldn't be hard to write a a step that would then connect um, R to Python, pass the data to Python, have it do the pre-processing there, return all the information it needs to you know, do that technique on new data um, and have that come along. So you know, R is sort of our default compute engine here, but uh, we can certainly, since um, these things are sort of like modularized, we can certainly do that with you know, Weka or TensorFlow or what have you. As long as that stuff is installed when you're in a place where you're using R and, and you you know have code to make that connection, um, we can start writing steps for other packages, basically. So that's kind of a cool thing. Not available yet, but it's there. It will be there eventually. So here's an example. Um, in our book, we took some data, some image segmentation data, where people took a bunch of images of cells, and sometimes the, uh, the imaging software did a good job of saying where the cell boundary is, and other times it, it didn't. So that's called segmentation of a cell. And so we have a data set where we have uh, a couple thousand uh, rows. We have a couple thousand images and, and cells, and they've been already classified as being you know, well segmented or poorly segmented. And they wanted to have a model that basically predicted that based on a bunch of imaging uh, derived qualities of those cells, like how big they are, how they're shaped, and so on. And so basically, we want to build a model that takes the imaging. Uh, data and then makes a prediction on whether that cell was well segmented or poorly segmented. Because if we really think strongly it's poorly segmented, we probably want to filter those cells out of our subsequent analysis. So you know we can build a model to um, to do that. Um, I'm not really going to do the model building here. What I want to do is show um, there's 58 imaging predictors in this data set, and and many of them are highly highly correlated. So if we want to look at our data and say, okay, are there any outliers here? Are there any um, weird features in the data? We might do some dimension reduction techniques to figure out um, you know, how can we project those 58 dimensions down to only a few dimensions and still capture what's going on in that data set. So I'll use some steps based on dimension reduction to highlight that. So let's say you were to add, uh, or if you hadn't loaded dplyr and caret, you would load those. The data is in the segmentation data um, uh, object. And then, uh, Segmentation data has, they, they had, the original authors pre-specified what data they use for training, what data they use for testing. So I'm going to use a little piping here and filter out uh, to make this training version of the data set. I'll filter out the, um, or I'll, I'll keep only the ones that, that had case equal train, and then I'll get rid of uh, two, oops, two um, columns in that data set that are the, the uh, data set identifier and the actual number of the cell, like it's individual cell ID. And then I do the same thing. So I have a, a data set that only has what the original idea of a test set was. There's about a thousand cells in each one of these data sets. So what I'll do is I'll estimate any statistics I need from the training set, like you know the PCA loadings and things like that, and then apply them to the test set. And then that's what I'll do the graphics on. So that's the data set we'll use. So we'll start off with just a simple recipe. Um, the class variable is the one that is uh, a factor that is whether something is well segmented or poorly segmented. 
And I'll say, you know, everything else in the data set besides that class variable um, is a potential predictor. So that's the basic recipe where I've declared the roles for everything. And then what I'm going to do is uh, some of these predictors are extremely skewed. Um, and so that can mess up some of the, you know, things like PCA that, that use variance as a, an objective function in, in how they do their computations. Um, now, some of these predictors are negative and highly skewed. And so there's this thing called the Al Johnson transform, which is sort of like the Box Cox transformation, and it can have the effect of unskewing your data. And we use this one instead of Box Cox because Box Cox requires your data to be uh, uh, non-negative. It can't be well; it can be zero. It has to be strictly positive. Um, and some of our data is not like that. So what we're saying is, all the predictors in our data set, we're going to estimate and apply this Yao Johnson transformation to make them a little less skewed. And then uh, some of these dimension reduction techniques, we're going to want to center and scale our predictors. So again, we've only said what we want to do here. We haven't done anything yet. Um, but there's three basic steps so far that we've sort of declared. And then when I prepare that recipe, I've just kept the same name. We're going to estimate these things from the training set. Um, I'm going to tell it not to print out the steps just because. And then I'm going to use this retain equal true again, and that'll allow us to recycle all these computations um, that get created uh, in subsequent steps. So let's say I want to do principal component analysis. Well, what I can do is I can take this sort of pre-trained recipe and, um, and add a step for principal component analysis. <clears throat> and so what this says is, hey, do PCA on all the predictors in the data set. Now, they're all numeric, so I don't need to specify their type. Um, and this other option says is, you know, give me the number of PCA components that uh, will capture 90%, basically, of the variability in the predictors. And so, you know, I don't know right now how many predictors that is, um, but it will give me enough to capture that information to make sure I have a pretty good representation of my original data. So again, what I've done here is I've just added a, oops, I've added a specification as to what I want, but I haven't actually done PCA yet. So there's a summary function for recipes, and when you run a summary function on it, what it tells you is what the available variables are, what their, um, you know, at this point in the recipe, um, what their type is, are they numbers or, or are they factors and things like that. It tells you their role and whether there are variables that have been derived or the original variables. And so you can see right now I have 59 variables, so there's 40, uh, 58 predictors in an outcome class. And, um, and that's what it is because I haven't done PCA yet. I haven't transformed this data into principal components because I haven't prepared it yet. And so then let's say we do that preparation. We don't have to re-estimate, again, centering and scaling these things. But this fourth step when we do the prepare function on it computes all the loadings that we need to do PCA. And then if I do the summary um, method on that, now it's telling me the things that are available in the recipe are these variables called PCO1, PCO2, because I've actually done the recipe. So you know what variables are available to you at any given time cha can change depending on what you're asking it to do at each step. So prior to PCA, even though I center and scale and transform these variables, they were there under the original name. But now that I've done PCA, um, they're there under a different name. Um, so now we have the components. We can, um, we can bake them and get their actual values for the test set. And then if you just do a simple ggplot, um, you, you can see, you know, at least using PCA, what kind of separation do I have in the data? I don't really see any outliers here per se. And there's, you know, a fair amount of overlap in the data. So, you know, you know how difficult of a modeling problem this is uh, doesn't mean it's impossible, but at least from a linear classifier standpoint, you can get an idea that there's some separation, but not complete separation. Um, but you might think, well, you know, there might be some other sort of feature engineering type things I can do. And one of the things is if you've ever heard of uh, support vector machines, what you can do is you can, let's say, project your original predictors into a, another higher dimensional space that, that might be a nonlinear transformation. So you can sort of apply these sort of nonlinear transformations of your data in this thing called kernel principle component analysis. We'll do that transformation and then do PCA on top of that expanded dimensionality of your predictors. And the Kern Lab uh, package has a way to do that. We have a step for doing that. So, you know, our PCA recipe uh, utilized that basic recipe that just did the centering and scaling and transformation. And so instead of doing the regular PCA, now we can start with that original recipe and create another one that does print our kernel principle component analysis. We have to tell what kernel to use and some of the parameters, which I've done here. Um, but when we prepare that, 
we're only, you know, this has nothing to do with the PCA analysis we did previously, but it re-estimates everything it needs to for the kernel PCA. We bake that to get the values for the test set, and again, we can just ggplot that away. Here you see a little, it's different distributions, um, but I think there's a little bit more separation between the classes by doing this kernel, um, this kernel transformation beforehand. So, you know, this might be a good sort of feature engineering step to do. Um, you know, you can do like an isomap transformation, things like that. There are many other dimension reduction techniques you can do. Um, a really simple one you can also try is, uh, since we know the classes, we can compute sort of the multidimensional class centroids for each class. So we can take a 58-dimensional space, we can find the center of the distribution for the well-segmented predictors and the center of the distribution for the poorly segmented cells. Um, and then uh, this step class disk will will compute that, and then when you want to get new predictors, it will actually compute the distance of every individual data point to the centroid of the original classes. So it's almost like doing like a linear discriminant analysis in, uh, in here, uh, but it's sort of a, a, a as a pre-processing step rather than as a model. And so you can add a step for that. Again, use all the predictors. Since you need to know the classes to do the um, centroids, you need to tell what class to use, and that's this variable here. And these are distances, which tend to be skewed, so let's just log transform those predictors that we get that come out of this class disk um, step. And so, again, we prepare that. Uh, we don't have to redo computations, and then we bake them. Uh, the data that comes out of that is we have the original class. Um, you can see I have a matches here. It says, give me all the variables in the computed recipe that start with class, whether it's uppercase C or lowercase C. Um, and I have the original class variable, and then the distances to the, uh, to the poorly segmented class centroid and the well-segmented class centroid. Um, and it turns out when you do that, I think you get the most separation between these, these data. You do see some outliers that are induced here, um, so you might want to look into those data points. But if you, you know, what we did here is we did some different um, feature engineering steps um, utilizing this basic recipe and just kind of layered them on without having to redo a bunch of computations. So, you know, you can do the same thing with models where you might then put these um, design matrices into various models to see what does better or worse uh, for, the, for the model that you're trying to use. And hopefully this is illustrated, you know, where you can just recycle all these computations and uh, the sort of simplicity of doing that. So that's the example. Um, just to get give you an idea of the next steps, uh, we're um, we have another package uh, that Lionel is working on called Tidy Select, and, and recipes sort of depends on that for some of the selectors. So as soon as that's on CRAN, which should be soon, uh, we'll get recipes on CRAN. Uh, another thing that comes in handy is you know you know recipes right now since it's not linked directly to any modeling methods, it's kind of like having one shoe in a way where you know you you can get Pretty far with it you can get your design matrices and things like that but it would be nice to have that integrated into a bunch of models and at least the first step of doing that is having a, a, a couple methods in carrot to do that so you know in carrot if you want to specify your model with some pre-processing you would do some some syntax like this where you either use the formula method or give it the, uh, the x and y uh, uh, data sets and then say which pre-processing you want to use like you know PCA or centering and scaling what, what I'm doing right now is creating a new interface uh, in addition to the ones that are already there where you can say, hey, have this recipe. Um, here's the data you're going to use for training. You don't need to declare what the pre-processing is because it's built into that recipe. So you can start specifying your models in train at least, you know, which is wrapped to like 200 different types of models. Um, and, you know, use that to both say what the predictors and outcomes are, but also do the, the sort of expanded set of pre-processing techniques that are here compared to what is in carrot so far. So that's that's one of the next steps. Um, and then after that is, you know, there's there's more new modeling packages coming. So these will all integrate with those modeling packages. Um, so that's what's next on board. Um, and thanks for uh, making it this far. Okay, let's see. Um, Start with the flag ones if you. Right. So, George, is it possible to store and return the results uh, later? Now, if you mean the um, the results in terms of the intermediate steps, so like when we did PCA, we had to compute the loadings. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, that's basically what it does. Is it when you do the prepare, it computes the um, the loadings and their 
you know, I, I use cash. I mean, they're basically saved to that object. So you can extract them, you can use them on future data points uh, and whatnot. And now when you say, can we uh, store the results? If you're talking about the, um, the design matrix, um, yeah, I mean, you, can, you could use bake on that and save that as an object. So if I'm understanding either of those cases, yes, you can uh, save and return them. That's, that's one of the main things that it will do. Uh, let's see. In the training set, what happens if the variable is being turned into a dummy variable is not included? Let's see, it happens if all of the variables are not included. So I'm not quite sure what you mean. Um, you, you have to declare that you want to make dummy variables out of factors. So if you, if I, for example, if I didn't use that step dummy, step under bar dummy for the housing type, then when you bake that recipe, it's still going to, it's not going to be modified. So, you know, a formula will automatic. well, 99% of the time, a formula method will automatically convert factor variables to dummy variables in most of the modeling functions. There are a lot of exceptions to that, like random force and R part, and a lot of tree-based methods don't do that, and they don't really tell you they don't do that. Um, but right now, if you want to get dummy variables, you have to use that step dummy uh, step to make sure that that happens. So if that's your question, then um, uh, that would be the answer. Um, but otherwise, if you don't do anything to them, they just they stay in the original form and they just they come along for the ride. Is there any steps in recipes to select the uh, test training um, breakup? And what about cross validation? So, um, no. And I've thought about that quite a bit. Um, the thing is, any steps that you do, uh, you, they have to be operations that you would apply to any data set. And so, if you think about splitting data. You're going to differentially um, do things to each data set. So you know, I'm trying to think of a better way to say that. So one thing I thought about including is there's a bunch of subsampling methodologies, like if you have class amounts, it's like downsampling. And I thought, oh, that would make a great step. I should put that in here. But you don't necessarily want to always downsample. So you might want to downsample your training set, but when you go to make predictions on your test set, you don't want to downsample that. So I've kind of left splitting steps out of there and things that would filter rows for the most part i've done that now one thing that we're talking about doing is um and this is just we're just talking about this right now i haven't implemented anything is being able to include dplyr type filters in steps so you might you know pipe in a step to do centering and scaling but then you want to let's say filter on some variable that's there so you can imagine doing you know filter by or filter uh, which is in dplyr to a recipe and there are some some of those dplyr operations that I don't see any reason why they wouldn't work here. So there might be ways of doing that in the future, but I, I haven't coded them up. Uh, but just realize anything you do in a, in a step is something that you're going to always do to whatever data you're applying it to. Um, so there might be some, some things that you don't want to include in the step. Uh, in terms of cross-validation, uh, funny you should mention that. I mean, um, I'm like 80% done with another R package that I haven't made public yet um, that will um, have a bunch of like standardized infrastructure for resampling, whether it's cross-validation or time series resampling and things like that. So, you know, it's, a, it's very much like what Model R does uh, with maybe some expanded um, ways of doing things. So um, in, there, in, in that vignette, which I shouldn't talk about things I haven't released yet, um, there are examples of how to include recipes into this uh, cross-validation scheme. So uh, it's not out there yet, but you don't probably don't want to wait too long to, to see that. Um, are there vignettes? Yes. Uh, if you go to the, the recipes, um, uh, again, there'll be a link in the, the webinar notes. But if you just go to GitHub and Google on recipes, well, you'll probably get, ha Hadley has a, like a home set of recipes, like food actual recipes. You'll probably find that first. But uh, under mine, get my uh, Topepo, GitHub account, if you go to that recipes directory or repo, um, there's a GitHub IO uh, link there that has, I think there's three vignettes there and all the, the documentation. Uh, so yeah, there's there's a lot there right now, including if you want to write your own recipe, like how would you do that? So there's like a full example of another recipe that we just created from scratch and, and the things that we need to do there. Uh, why is it necessary to specify the same data, data set in both the recipe and prepare functions? Uh, you don't really. So I did that out of convenience here, but let's say you have a data set that's like a couple terabytes or something, and you've got it in memory in R. When you first declare the recipe, you know you could just take the first hundred data points, let's say, from that 
that, uh, that big data set and use that to define the recipe. Because the only thing that the original recipe does is, um, is get an accounting of what variables are in the data set and what their types are. Um, so you don't really need to do that. That was just out of convenience here. Then when you do prepare, then all the data that goes in, into prepare is the things that you want to estimate parameters on. So, so that data set uh, you want to be the more full and, um, and expanded, you know, the real data set you want to do computations are. But when you define the, the recipe initially, um, you don't need to have the, the complete data set there. Just enough for it to get a sense. It's like, like uh, Radar does is, it, you know, it does an initial scan of the data to get a sense of, you know, what columns in your CSV file are numbers or dates or what have you. It kind of does something like that where it just takes a look at that data and says, oh, what do I have on hand? So um, it doesn't need to know their distributions, you know, their full probability distributions or anything like that. Uh, where can I find other examples of recipes? Um, right now, those would mostly be in the vignettes or just training materials. Again, since I haven't put it on CRAN, uh, it hasn't been widely circulated. So right now, it's sort of limited, but you know, I'm hoping that that will be uh, um, there will be more for you to bite into there. Um, I'm certainly, you know, for papers and and other things that I'm doing now, I, I'm sort of transitioning over to recipes. And a lot of the steps that are in there are just things that I've been doing for data analysis for papers or books or whatever. Um, so there will be many more examples, but right now, not, not so much. Um, why just extend carrot rather than create a, a new recipe package? That's a great question. Um, I mean, you know, I love carrot. I love working on that, and I'm still working on that. Uh, the thing about carrot is it's very, it's very monolithic in the sense that uh, if you've ever used it, you know, the way resampling or pre-processing and things like that, it's all embedded into sort of one big function. And so when you want to make modifications to the system, that, you know, the consequences of doing that, since it's not very modular, uh, are, are pretty severe, to be honest with you. And so the idea of having a separate package is it, it sort of isolates those new things that you want to do without you worrying about backward compatibility, you don't have to worry about, well, wait, how does this affect this and that? So it's easier to make a separate package that has these steps and these sort of ideas in it and make adapters for Carrot than funneling all this stuff into Carrot. Um, another good reason not to do this in Carrot is Carrot already has like a lot of dependencies. And so uh, I don't want to like double down on that um, uh, just for the sake of how long it takes CRAN to, to check these things. Uh, so it's more, you know, the, the idea going forward is to have more modular blocks of code in different packages. Um, you know, like, like a good example might be like, like ggplot, right? I mean, we could always take everything that people want to do with ggplots and just add them into the original package. But it's, it's actually easier just to have extensions of ggplot in different packages. Same thing with Shiny, right? I mean, um, it's better not to have everything in one huge package. Probably have time. The impact would be helpful. Have you considered further categorization of predictor role um, as predictors of interest versus adjustment variable? Yeah, and so, so yeah, you could do that. Um, so, for example, when you're creating the roles, um, if you create them sort of, sort of like by piping new roles in, that's how you would do that. So, you know, I had an example where you had a, a modeling function where you had predictors that were used for splitting and predictors that are used for um, uh, fitting models and so you could have a, a role called like predictor under bar split or whatever you want to call it So you you can do that and then when you use bake you can just extract those particular variables or those roles Or you can extract all the variables with you know these two or three roles. So yeah, you definitely have the ability to do that um, I was talking to somebody yesterday about latent variable modeling where you you have different variables that you would include with different latent variable like layers um, and so that's the same thing is you could have a role that's for, you know, for latent variable Z and another one for latent variable whatever. Um, so you, you can do that using roles basically, which is kind of why we, we created the roles. Uh, any plans to make this work with Sparkly R? Um, I don't know. I mean, that's one question we've been talking about is, you know, what happens when you have remote data? Like, we, we've been paying a lot of attention to that, but there's nothing coded right now. And it's the same thing with Python or anything else is, what do you do, you know, it would make sense to have recipes operate on things that are not in memory in R. Um, so that's something we, we've been talking and thinking a lot about, but there's no code written to do that. 
Um, sort of like with dplyr, though, you got to kind of watch out because there might be something that Spark doesn't do that, let's say, recipes does. So it would be weird if your data is in Spark and you want to do centering and scaling. Well, well, Spark can probably do that. Um, but what you don't want to do is you don't want to try to declare a recipe step that is not doable, let's say, in Spark or, or anything else. Uh, at least we have to figure out how to manage that. Do you want to pull those data out of Spark and into R to do that recipe step? So there's there's a layer of complexity there. It's doable, um, but we just have to make sure that uh, we do that without like bringing the whole system down sort of thing. So there's some complexity, but that's definitely things from the from the beginning that we've been talking about doing. So not as such yet, but in the future, yes, I think so.